The second part of the paper uh, deals with a, a class of neutral metrics um, which are of particular interest to me, which are geodesic spaces. So uh, let's start out with the three manifold, uh, which is so 3D uh, space of constant curvature. So in fact, really what we're looking at are uh, OR3, H3, and S3, as, as we mentioned in the last slide. Um, now, let's L of M be the space of oriented geodesics of your three manifold. And, well, variously, depending on whether it's OR3, H3, or S3, uh, let's say in the case of OR3, it's going to be, as we said, TS2. In the case of H3, it's S2 cross S2 minus the diagonal, in fact, the reflected diagonal, to be precise. And in the case of S3, it's just S2 cross S2. So there are the four manifolds that we're going to be looking at. Now, S2 cross S2 doesn't have... Um, a boundary, but still it has a neutral metric, an invariant neutral metric, as does all of these. So again, I guess the key thing is that uh, L of M3 admits a canonical neutral metric. Um, again, it has the same properties as uh, the one we, we, we wrote down a minute ago. In, it's conformally flat. It's scalar flat, uh, but it's not Einstein. Uh, but not Einstein. So these metrics, it turns out these are quite interesting in the sense that they're not, uh, it's not true for high, any uh, other dimension. So if you take the space of oriented geodesics of a four dimensional space of constant curvature, uh, you do not have these canonical new, uh, metrics uh, on them in general. So it's quite a, it's an interesting class that is really dimension dependent. Okay, so let's try and see how we can use that. So let's kind of draw a kind of dichotomy. So let's start out with M3. I'll tend to think of it in my own head as OR3, but let's just look at M3. It can be any of these constant curvature spaces. And what I'm interested in is taking a surface S, which is closed convex. Yeah, in fact, strictly convex is fine. So that means this, the second fundamental form is definite, is, is, is positive definite. So that means strictly convex. So we have a, a strictly convex surface. And what we can look at are the normal vectors to the surface. In fact, we can look at the normal lines, the oriented normal lines to the surface. Um, it doesn't have to be round, it can be any convex body for what we're going to be talking about. And if you look at that set of oriented lines, it of course is another surface. So if you look at the space of, space of all oriented geodesics uh, in that space, in fact, this is your four manifold. So let me draw the axis a little bit messy like that. And then what you end up with here is again is a sphere. Uh, maybe I'll draw it, I should possibly draw it in blue because this is the oriented normals form a surface in the space of oriented geodesics. And these are in fact uh, Lagrangian with respect to the canonical uh, symplectic structure that also exists on this space. So Lagrangian, uh, this is a Lagrangian surface. Uh, the other thing that we can look at, and this is probably what we spend more of our time at uh, in the paper, are instead of looking at the lines that are uh, perpendicular to the surface, you can look at the lines that are tangent to the surface. Uh, and you can have that at each point. So, in fact, at each point you can see you have a circle's worth of uh, these lines. Uh, you can rotate that around the normal and you'll get another line. And so what you get over here is a hypersurface. You have an S1 for each uh, point on the surface. On the, uh, so over here, now it's going to be distinct. Obviously these lines are far away in some sense from these lines. They're perpendicular. So it's not going to intersect this, this uh, surface. You have a hypersurface here. Now I can't really draw it, but whatever. It's going to look something like it's a hypersurface of some sort. And it's fi fibred by circles. It has lots of fibers by circles given by rotating about the normal. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of nice structure on this, uh, this hypersurface. So I guess you should call that sigma. And this hypersurface we call H of S. The hypersurface, tangent hypersurface is what we refer to it as. Um, 
Now, what's of interest here is that h of s is null. So the, as we said, this means that its normal vector has zero, um, has zero length. And in fact, the normal vector is generated by dd phi. So, so with the normal, uh, dd phi. So by rotating around here, that's your circle, and that's precisely, these are the normals to the hypersurface. They lie in the hypersurface and they foliate it by circles. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, h of s uh, bounds a disk bundle. So bounds a disk bundle in these GD6 spaces. Um, so you have this disk bundle over the surface. It's in fact all the GD6 that intersect the surface anywhere. And this disk bundle, uh, its boundary is equal to the hypersurface, h of s. So in fact what we have here is a disk bundle uh, who, which has, uh, it's neutral, it's contained in a neutral four manifold, it's neutral and it has null boundary. So this is exactly the class of four manifolds with boundary that we um, say we're interested in in the title of the paper. Okay, so this structure in the boundary turns out to be quite interesting in the sense that uh, the alpha planes and the beta planes, uh, so the alpha planes and the beta planes are contact here. So they're maximally non-integral. Um, so now, if we continue, once you have these contact structures in a three manifold, there's uh, some interesting uh, knot invariants that you can construct from those. So let's start out, let's take a, a curve C in this hypersurface. Uh, so what is this C? Well, it's a one parameter family of oriented lines or GD6 which are all tangent to the surface S in the background space. So in fact what this is is an oriented line field uh, over a curve. See this I guess projects, you can project that down to the point of contact and if we call C the point, the curve of contact that's just going to be pi of C. Okay, so as a definition then we can say that uh, C is alpha Legendrian or beta Legendrian we can similarly define. So it's alpha Legendrian if it is tangent to the hypersurfaces, to the, sorry, to the alpha planes I should say, to the alpha planes and similarly for the beta planes you can talk about beta Legendrian. Okay, so again, the picture here in M3 is you have a surface S, and then over here you have this hypersurface in the space of oriented GD6. So this is L of M3 here, and this here is your hypersurface H of S. And your curve, well, you take your curve C here, whatever, it might be knotted, might be doing whatever. So that's your curly C. And then over here, what does that represent? Well, it's in this hypersurface, so every one of these lines is actually tangent to S. So in fact, the point of contact can cross itself and do funny things. Let's call that C. And then the actual uh, curve in the hypersurface is oriented lines along this. Now they may not be tangent, they may not be normal, they could do, spin around in general, depending on exactly how that lies in the uh, in that hypersurface. Now, given such a thing, uh, our second theorem is as follows. So theorem two of the paper states the following. So a curve C is alpha Legendrian if and only if uh, C is tangent to the contact curve. So at each point on the contact curve, the oriented normal line, the blue line I was drawing, is in fact the tangent to the curve. Now it would be nice if beta Legendrian meant that it was um, not tangent but normal, but it's not quite true. So we have something else. Uh, so moreover, if two of the following hold, uh, 
than the third does. And the third holds, so what are the three conditions? Well, the first condition is that C is beta Legendrian. Uh, the second is that C is normal to little c. And the final condition, uh, so if these two are true, the third condition is that C is umbilic or a line of curvature of your original surface S. So if if your curve on your surface in your space of order, in your your constant curvature three manifold is uh, umbilic every point is umbilic well then the beta Legendrian curves are exactly the normals similarly if it's a line of curvature of the underlying surface it's a beta Legendrian curve um, uh, the normal is a beta Legendrian curve so the, any two of these implies the third so. The next thing then is say, well, how we, can we use that? So what we want to consider, and again, it's in, indicated without too much further detail, uh, as to how we could use this to construct neutral knot invariants. So for neutral knot invariants, well, we have to kind of get a bit of an idea of what a knot would look like. So let's again take M3 and if you take your surface, so here we go, you've got your surface S, and in fact, I'm not going to take the full surface, let's just take a little disk, these are all local, so let's just take that disk D there, sitting in that surface, and then let's look at the, the hypersurface of all the tangent vectors to this D, if you like, H of D. Well, that's actually going to be a solid torus, so let me draw it. There's your solid torus, so your disk here be here and as you rotate around that's your angle phi there. So that's the h of d is, is d cross s1. So two disc cross s1, it's a solid torus. Now what I'd like to be able to do is kind of see well what kind of knots in the solid torus here arise from what line fields in this surface. So let me take some simple examples. So again, we'll just have to picture this all on that knot. The first one I'm going to draw is if you take a figure eight, a figure eight like this. Again, this is sitting on this D. Again, just think of it sitting in there. And then look at the oriented normals to that. So your oriented normals do this. You point inwards here, point outwards there, and cross over there. So that's an embedded curve into the solid torus here. So what does that look like? In fact, that is the unknot. So this is the way the unknot looks. If you were to draw this in the solid torus, it just goes around and turns around and comes back. So this is the unknot. So this is the simplest possible knot in this tangent model. Uh, what about, uh, we know coming back here, of course, pi one of your h of s is not zero. It's in fact, you know, it's, it's it's a Z, it's got a circle of a, a generator. And obviously the circle generator is the one in the core of the torus. So how would, we, how would that be a knot? Well, where, where would you see that? So instead, take your D here and just take the oriented normals to a, the, the unknot. So just take, without any messing around, just take that. Again, that's a curve. It gives rise to a, a knot in this torus. Um, and what is it? Well. It's not too hard to see, you're just rotating around like that. So that's the generator of your pi one, of your hypersurface in the boundary. Generator of pi one of the boundary. Um, now, of course, your four manifolds we've been dealing with are all simply connected. So, in fact, pi one of the four manifold is zero, and you can always fill this in if you like. There's a disk in the interior which will uh, has this as boundary, and you can find that disk, in fact, just by lifting the normal lines up and look at the disk of lines that pass through that central point there, for example. Okay, so these are the simplest kind of knots, the generator of pi one and the on knot. Well, let's just maybe do one or two more just to get a, a bit more of a picture of what's going on. So again, here we have some disk. And what I'm interested in is the following. Um, I'm introducing a new 
notation. So let's take this curve. I'm going to orient it as well. And let's look at, first of all, we're going to do two things. We're going to take at every point in it, or most points in it, we'll just look at the oriented normal. You could take the tangent, it doesn't really matter. So you take your oriented normal. And then when you come down to this point here, again, assuming that you're moving in that direction, I want you to go through a half turn, so in, an uh, in a positive direction. And when you do that, then you're going to be on the inside and then goes up and over, and then when you come out here, go through a minus a half. So go back clockwise, sorry, counterclockwise, in the minus, sorry, clockwise that is actually, and then continue on, this will be here. Now, if you look at that, so again, the, the normal lines, you have your curve there, and then when you come to here, you're just rotating, then you go around, and then you rotate the opposite direction. So what does that look like in this torus over here, uh, in the space of oriented, the boundary, of this set in the space of oriented GD6. In fact, this is uh, the positive, it is a the positive whitehead link. Uh, looks like that. In fact, if you didn't like this spinning by a half on either side, you can actually put a cusp in uh, so there are many ways that this is uh, isotopic to the following. If you take the normal the whole way around, you get this kind of double heart. So an equivalent uh, one where you don't do this spinning at a point is uh, to look at the oriented normal lines to this one. And again, it'll give you this positive whitehead link. Um, I guess as a last example, let's look at the negative whitehead link. Well, it looks kind of similar if you do it in the way I've just done it here. Um, except this here, you've got to spin through minus three over two, and this you've got to spin it through plus three over two. Again, I'm fixing the orientation in that direction. And if you, again, you use the normal all the way around, then you do your spin and then continue along in the normal the other way around. Um, what you get in the torus uh, is, let me, it's a bit better. Uh, the torus here, you get exactly the opposite I'm going to do this properly for you, sorry, better. Now, so you get the negative whitehead. So this is the negative whitehead link. Okay, and then I guess there's also, if you wanted the equivalent to this picture here for the negative whitehead link is the following. Um, something like that. So it has no cusps, but it has lots of crossings. So again, if you take the normal to this curve, again, we're thinking of that sitting on the disk, as we are, in fact, with all of them. Uh, in, the, in the torus, uh, in the solid torus, you end up with the negative whitehead link there. So there I've just given some examples of some simple knots or links. Uh, and what do I want to uh, do with that? Well, my claim is that if you take a knot in this H of S, you can see, well, this, this is an oriented uh, line field uh, along a curve, along a curve C contained in your surface S. And as you would do to construct uh, standard knot invariants, the ciphered surface associated with this uh, then would be an oriented uh, line field uh, over a set such that the boundary of the set is this curve C. Um, finally, if we do this, then we can see what we're moving towards is that you have what are called the classical knot invariants. So classical knot invariants, now they're defined for Legendrian knots or for transverse knots, etc. So there's different variations of this, but essentially there's the thurston Benequin uh, index, and the other thing we have is what's called the rotation. And the claim is that these uh, invariants in the neutral picture can be related to indices of these vector fields, singularities of these vector fields, of the vector fields. And these oriented vector fields are line fields, I guess. I don't know what you call them, vector fields or line fields. Um, so 
What's interesting here is that, for example, uh, uh, Legendre and some of these Legendrian invariants and the uh, Reidemeister moves that you can do, in fact, then relate to just addition of these uh, singularities of these vector fields. Um, so again, you can kind of see the idea here. What we're trying to do is use this neutral uh, structure overlay in this picture and to use those to extract information about knots in this particular tangent model, as I call it.